Moving right along here, um, so uh, Emma and Megan and, and Michael are gonna um, dialogue with us again in preparation for Dr. Francis's talk regarding um, his uh, TMA team at uh, uh, Boston Medical Center. So um, the open question uh, in this segment is, um, how long did it did it take you to connect your symptoms with with a diagnosis? And and we talked about this a little uh, in a little more detail, but maybe maybe a little of a timeline. Was there a lag? Uh, did people find out exactly? Was there a striking problem that they uh, recognized and said, "You got to get treated." Um, mine was like almost immediate. Um, it took a few weeks here and there because of blood tests and things going wrong. Um, I think at the time that I was supposed to have the blood test done, um, the technician, for whatever reason, had let it thaw out, so it was no longer able to be tested. Um, I think if it would have been tested, that I would have found out a lot sooner, uh, probably before I had miscarried. Um, but I didn't end up finding out until after I had miscarried, and all of it had just like come on at once. Um, I was diagnosed on my 19th birthday. Um, kind of makes it really easy to remember now. Uh, and it was a period of three days that everything like happened all at once. It had slowly started with the um, hemorrhaging and uh, just fatigue and all of that stuff. And over the course of three weeks, it was a very slow progress until I had miscarried and then it was like a, a dam broke loose and all of it came flooding at once. Uh, I had the liver failure, I had the kidney failure, I had um, all, of, all of the other symptoms that go along with this and my platelets were um, under 5,000 and so that was when my doctor was like, yeah, you, you've got to get on this now. We'll test you again later, but I'm almost positive this is what you have. So it was kind of here and there, but for the most part, fast. Really striking. Emma? Uh, I'll be or next. Michael, go ahead. Yeah. Sure. Um, because I got sick in 2002, um, and not much was known about AHOS at the time, um, it took a long time to get a final diagnosis. Yeah. yeah. And that was pretty normal at the time. So uh, I'll just describe what was happening uh, after my first episode. Um, I returned to work for about two months when uh, I was, had a second uh, attack of my kidneys. Um, a biopsy was done, and as a result, uh, there was internal bleeding, which needed an Im immediate angiogram and cauterization, and I was hospitalized at that point. I had never experienced pain that bad in my life. They put me on morphine since nothing else controlled the pain. The biopsy results complete, showed complete kidney failure. I was put on hemodialysis, and we started training to do it at home, my wife and I together. Uh, they sent me back home prematurely from the hospital, which became a huge burden for my wife. She did not feel supported by the doctors and was burdened by the responsibility of looking after me as well as doing the training for dialysis. I was so unwell that I could not walk on my own. It was because of my wife's insistence that I was readmitted to the hospital within a week. Two days later, I was placed in the ICU when my blood pressure reached 100, uh, 248 over 158, and I had symptoms of TIA again. I was dizzy, confused, unable to speak, and my vision was blurry. I was hospitalized for four months then while the doctors tried to stabilize me. Uh, this period was extremely rough on me and my family, and I want to emphasize my family because I want you to know that emotionally the caregiver can go through much more difficulty than the patient. We had two young children at the time, age three and six. On several occasions, Marguerite was un unsure if she would return to the hospital the next day to find me dead or alive. Fortunately, much help was offered by our friends and community for care of our children because Marguerite was visiting me almost daily. Having a spouse hanging on by a thread while you are trying to manage a busy household and do training for dialysis was very stressful for her, to say the least. From my point, I was sedated for episodes of severe pain, so I did not give much thought to the severity of my situation at the time. 
besides dealing with my pain, the recovery from morphine was difficult because of terrifying hallucinations when no one was around to help me deal with it. Towards the end of my four month stay at the hospital, Marguerite and I were trained to do the nocturnal hemodialysis so that I could have the best possible dialysis and hopefully return to work. Dialysis went relatively well and eventually I was able to return to work full time. However, it did not allow me to be away from home more than two days at a time. The dialysis has made many difficulties in our life and the health risks are associated with it as well. We pursued a kidney transplant after three years of my initial sickness. Marguerite wanted to donate one of her, her kidneys so that I could stop dialysis, become healthy again, and to improve our lifestyle. She was a match and the transplant was done in 2006. Then came the next blow for our family. While the transplant surgery went well, the anti-rejection medication triggered a third episode of AHOS within two weeks of the surgery. My new, fail my new kidney began to fail and the transplant doctors desperately tried to keep it going for two years. They could not understand why the transplant did not work. And keep in mind at this time they thought I had TTP. After two years, I begged them to give up and let me go back on dialysis because the severe swelling and plasma exchanges were much more difficult to deal with than dialysis. After returning on dialysis, I tried returning to work, but it was a failure. My fatigue was so severe that some days I could not drive, even though it was just morning time. Also working while fatigued was not an option for me as I worked with open electrical equipment. I have been off work for over 10 years now. At one point, my nephrologist thought that the transplanted kidney may be troubling me and decided to remove it with the hope that the fatigue would go away. Unfortunately, that did not help in any way. It was not until 2010, which is eight years after my initial sickness, that I was finally given the correct diagnosis of AHUS. During the time of mixed diagnosis, the doctors were baffled by all the one-of-a-kind symptoms I had. Over and over, we heard the doctors say that they had never seen a case like mine. The symptoms obviously did not match their experiences with TTP. The proper diagnosis only came about because my paternal cousin had been recently diagnosed with AHUS. I was put in do touch with Dr. Christoph Licht, who some of you might know, who works out of Sick Kids Hospital in Toronto. Dr. Licht had my blood tested and the C3 mutation was confirmed. I want you to be sure that I do not blame anyone on this lengthy misdiagnosis. It was a lack of information of EHOS and the science just catching up at the time. We hope that no one else ever has to live with wrong diagnosis if they have EHOS. I still worry that this may happen because of the rarity of EHOS and the lack of diagnostics in some remote areas of the world. Marguerite and I can't help but wonder what would happen, what would have happened if we had the correct diagnosis early on. We would not have tried the transplant and Marguerite's kidney would still be available for me to have a transplant today. Um, okay, so there's probably gonna be quite a few parallels and uh, things that are quite similar to my story, story in there with you. Um, so I was a student, so 22 in Glasgow, up in Scotland, um, and I went to a party with my friends and developed, we all developed like a flu-like uh, infection a couple of days <coughs> later. Um, and my friends sort of said they had the same symptoms as me, but I felt really dreadful. I remember crawling, literally crawling to the telephone in the lounge from my bedroom to ring home to my mum and just tell her how ill I felt. And there was a, a I was sort of asking her what the symptoms of meningitis were because I just thought that maybe that was it and I remember her asking about my neck. Um, and then I sort of picked up a little bit and uh, I, you know, I, I, was, I was feeling really cold, I was, um, had sickness, diarrhea, um, but it was kind of, these symptoms were coming and going and it was all a little bit confusing. I took myself to the doctor in Glasgow uh, where they told me I'd got gastric flu and there'd been 10 patients earlier in the day who'd come in with the same symptoms. Um, so I went off to told to drink some fluids and you know get my rest and, and I'd get better and I expected to get better. 
I went back to Manchester, it was over the Christmas period, um, and I went back to Manchester to my parents' house, um, and I didn't get better. And all my friends now, the flu was really, you know, the cold or flu was completely behind them, and yet I was still struggling to get over this. And I remember my mum asking me to come down um, and play a board game on Christmas Day, and I just, I, I found it, I, I just couldn't believe she was asking me to, to make that monumental effort, but I did make the effort. Um, but it, I just, I just was n not getting better. I was so tired, so cold, so achy, just felt dreadful. Um, I went back to the doctor, doctors in Manchester. They told me I'd probably got the, the equivalent gastric flu uh, in Manchester, and I'd just been really unlucky and got this virus twice now, and everything was really struggling to, to overcome that. Um, I went back a further. <laughs> three times, I think, and eventually a doctor said, well, maybe this is glandular fever, maybe that's been triggered by the virus, so we'll go and get you, your bloods done. So um, my dad took me off for a blood test, um, and uh, my face started to swell up, um, and I rang the doctor back, and he put me on steroids for that, um, which I couldn't keep down. And uh, it was similar to something that used to happen to me in my childhood, uh, which got put down to allergies, but... Um, it, it was kind of strange. These symptoms were really strange. It was very confusing trying to make sense of them. Um, once the blood results, uh, one particular morning, I rang my mum at work and I said, I, I, I'm not getting better. I feel dreadful. And my mum, something just twigged and she was like, no, that doctor's coming out to you. We're going to get to the bottom of this. So the doctor came out. He got the blood test results. He was round within about three minutes because I'd got kidney failure um, and I needed to go to hospital straight away. Um, the, once I got to the hospital, sorry, um, I was diagnosed quite quickly with hemolytic uremic syndrome. Um, the doctor came into the room and said, this is what we suspect you've got. And I asked him to write it on a magazine, so because I'd not heard of anything so complicated, um, so that I could uh, share that diagnosis with, with my family. Um, they needed a biopsy, but I wasn't well enough to have the biopsy, and they started to treat me with uh, plasma and blood products and all sorts of things. Um, and I remember feeling really, really dreadful then, because I started to swell up. Um, and unfortunately, back then, there was no dialysis. They put a line in my neck ready for dialysis, which was all really scary. Um, but I couldn't have dialysis because it wasn't open on a Sunday. And I remember sitting on the side of the bed, saying, uh, begging people to give me something to make me feel better. Um, Unfortunately, that night, I uh, deteriorated further, started to cough up blood, um, and went into heart and respiratory failure, and they had to call the team from intensive care to take me rapidly down. And they described me as the sickest person in the hospital that night. Um, they were really, really worried about me. But like you say, um, at this point, really, the, the emphasis is on my loved ones around me because I don't really remember very much while I was in intensive care, just very vivid dreams and hallucinations when I came round and things like that. Um, I was given dialysis while I was, my first dialysis session was whilst I was in intensive care um, and everything was failing. I think um, I've been told that in a consultation, my family were told that every organ was failing apart from my liver, which was ironically the problem. So. Uh, <laughs> So, you know, I was, uh, it was a bad way. Um, so I came around from intensive care and they told me it was HUS. This was still an acute kidney failure, that they expected me to get better, that they'd just support me for a little while on dialysis and everything would be okay. And that carried on for 10 days, maybe a fortnight. Um, I was on dialysis regularly, but my potassium kept rising. My kidneys weren't showing any sign of improvement, at which point but they started to just debate whether this is TTP uh, and could it be the genetic form of, of HUS. Um, until eventually the doctor came into my room and said, your kidneys aren't going to get better. You need to be on some sort of dialysis so that you can go home. And I started the training for CAPD at that point. Um, I wasn't very well on CAPD. I slept in till two o'clock in the afternoon because I was so tired. I, um, I was depressed, I think. Uh, I had migraines, I was sick a lot. Um, this was going on for about two years of my life and I just, you know, the hope of even getting back to go, at the time I wanted to go back to university but that was just a distant hope. Um, and we were told at that point we, we'd done some of the genetic testing for press the good ship had uh, been involved over from Newcastle. Emma, what year was that? Pardon? Uh, what year was that? Um, it was 19... I was diagnosed in 
97, January, so it's probably 98, <coughs> something like that. Um, and the results came back telling me that I was positive for this factor H mutation. So I spent a lot of time making sure people knew it was factor H, not factor 8, because um, everyone th thought I was a haemophiliac. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, and that actually ruled out... as like you're desperate to get better I wanted a transplant we were told it was unlikely to work I think we were given about 40% chance but I was so ill that we would have taken 5% chance to get better because I, I wasn't who I used to be um, and my dad actually can't look at him, um, was a, a suitable um, donor but they realized that he also had the mutation which meant that he was ruled out and my mum eventually gave me a kidney um, and uh, unfortunately, as predicted, it did uh, return, the AHOS returned, and uh, I destroyed the kidney, feel very guilty about it, within about five days. Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, that, that's when the AHOS came back. I always say that I don't really feel like I've lived with AHOS, I feel like I've lived with kidney failure, and actually the two episodes of AHOS are just something that happened that, that led to, the, you know, the kidney failure. The second transplant, the symptoms of, of AHOS were controlled. It, I didn't, don't remember feeling the same way that I did. I was just overcoming the, the transplant surgery because I was being treated for all the, the, the I could, at that time they put the charts right in front of you and I could see the blood results like deteriorating and, and the doctors there were really confused because there'd been some confusion with the notes. So I ended up um, telling them that I thought this was AHOS returning because they thought it was just an episode of rejection. Um, and sort of suggesting things that had happened to me in the past, like plasma exchange and the um, and steroids and things like that. Um, I found some notes recently up in the, the loft, and it, I, I've written down like I'm going to ask them, do I need steroids? I'm going to ask, what about plasma? Um, and uh, yeah, so I didn't really have many symptoms other than that. And and then I went back onto uh, hemodialysis. Well, I went onto APD overnight, CAPD. And then um, was determined because I realised I wasn't going to be able to have a transplant. And at that point, I'd been told I wasn't going to get a transplant because it would fail. The same thing would happen. I fought to get myself on hemodialysis at home, um, which I used to do in the evenings. I didn't, never, didn't quite get to the nocturnal stage for, for a while. And I got my life back and I trained to be a teacher and uh, just lived with that part of me rather than it uh, taking over my whole life. Thank you very much for those um, profound stories. <laughs> Just to tie the three of them together, I, I, I think uh, we can say that there, there was a latent period, whether it was brief, uh, there was a latent period before a very dramatic presentation of disease. Um, and so if a diagnosis could be made during that latent period prior to an acceleration of symptoms seen by laboratory values, Potentially, that, that's the sweet spot where we need to, to intervene. Um, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Jean Francis. Um, he's going to be talking to us uh, about um, accelerated methods of making uh, appropriate diagnosis, thrombotic microangiopathies in general, but atypical HUS as well. He's the director of the Kidney Transplant Center at the um, Boston Medical Center. He's also on faculty at the Boston University uh, School of Medicine. and. Uh, Longtime colleague and friend of mine, um, certainly give you the stage. Sorry for the abbreviated time format, but at the same time, critical words you're going to have to say here. Thank you so much, Andrew. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks for the AHS Alliance for organizing all this uh, symposium. Thank you for the great stories and thank you for sharing them with us. And I think, uh, you know, the title here summarizes my entire talk. Like, this is the approach we took at uh, Boston University. Uh, medical center where we thought that a multidisciplinary approach to the diagnosis and management of TMA is probably better than having a single person to deal with such a complicated disorder. And uh, I'll show you our experience. It stems from case. This is my disclosure. So just a brief introduction. I know you all are very familiar with the disease. You know, hemolytic anemic syndrome is a thrombotic microangiopathy where there is this uh, maha, or this microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, and I will show you what it means in a second. Also thrombocytopenia and acutrenal failure. If you look at the normal glomerulus, the capillaries look wide open, 
happy looking and you look at a kidney biopsy from a patient with uh, atypical HUS, you can see those microtrombi filling up all those capillaries and the small arterioles in the kidney. This is why kidney fail. So in its classical form, this, a, this uh, hemolytic syndrome is usually preceded by a diarrheal prodrome and it's associated with Shiga toxin producing bacteria like E. coli or Shigella. But in its typical form, it is associated often with mutations affecting the complement regulatory proteins. And it, it, it has a very poor prognosis. 50% of the patient could reach end-stage renal disease. 25% of the patient could die if untreated appropriately. And definitely, as we saw in the, in the cases presented here, it often recurs after transplant and lead to graft failure. So what do we do clinically? Like, in the, you're in the emergency room, you see somebody presenting with decreased hemoglobin, you think of the TMA, you order aptoglobin, is, is often undetectable, LDH is usually elevated, you do a peripheral smear and you see a lot of schistocytes in the periphery and you're just like, ha, ah, this is TMA. And then you look for platelets, they dropped, usually less than 150, or a drop by more than 25% of the baseline number. And then you look for complement, but complement are tricky because in 40% are abnormal, but in the remaining you know, people with atypical HS, it's a complement disorder, complement levels are usually normal. And you know, to rule out TTP, we check at MTS 13, and if the activity is above 10%, this does not support TTP, and quickly, all of us, we do shigatoxin and rule out the possibility of shigatoxin-mediated hemolytic syndrome. So at the level of blood vessels, you have this activation or uncontrolled activation of the complement, inju injuring the endothelium and leading to diffuse microtrombi, and it could happen anywhere in the body, and this could lead to renal failure, neurological manifestation, or even gut disorders with bloody diarrhea. So those are you know, a, a, a typical presentation of atypical HUS, but this is not as easy. You know, I'll skip through this, but this is what we have to rule out before we call this uh, atypical HUS, because many, many diseases, and this is like a list of some of them here, you know, infections, parasites, vaccinations, cancers, metastatic cancers, and here's a list of the cancers. The most common form of TMA you will, we, will, we encounter, especially as nephrologists, is malignant hypertension, but this is also tricky. You know, is the malignant hypertension causing the TMA, or is the malignant hypertension a result of the TMA? And pregnancy is quite commonly associated with thrombotic microangiopathy and kind of like there's many, many differentials that Dr. Gordon will be describing in his, uh, in his session. Many autoimmune diseases could lead to thrombotic microangiopathies, lupus, antiphospholipid syndrome, scleroderma, dermatomyositis, you know, transplant, either bone marrow transplant or drugs used to prevent rejection in the solid organ transplants and many other disorders can cause similar presentation. You know, for us, we're always focused on TTP AHUS. And if we're lucky and we work in a hospital where ADAMTS 13 can be obtained within 24 hour, if the activity is more than 10%, you rule it out, and then you're left with AHUS, but you have to think about all the other possibilities before you, know, you make your diagnosis. This is why it's, we feel it's too complicated for a physician carrying 20 patients on his consult service to kind of deal with those patients. And I'll show you in a case what happened in our hospital. And then you think you nailed the diagnosis and you call it malignant hypertension, or you call it you know, uh, pregnancy associated HUS, or you call it this is systemic disease, uh, autoimmune disease causing uh, TMA, but then you look, and this, this slide was given to me by Dr. Marina Norris, you can see in her registry, almost 30% of the patient who presented with pregnancy associated hemolytic syndrome had complement mutation. Even their malignant hypertension, 18% of those patients had complement mutations. When they looked at the autoimmune uh, disease patient list, 24% of them, they had complement mutations, and you can see the list continues. So sometimes you can see there's an overlap between different TMAs, and you always have to think out of the box when your patient is not improving on the treatment that you're providing to your initial diagnosis. So that said, I will go over a case 
that triggered the creation at Boston Medical Center of the thrombotic, micro, uh, thrombotic microangiopathy team. So the patient is a 64-year-old woman with well-controlled HIV on, the, on antiretroviral uh, retroviral therapy. She was admitted with AKI, anemia, and thrombocytopenia. Creatinine was 3.9 from a baseline of 1. Platelets dropped to 64. And she had a very low hemoglobin of 6.8. And it was in the range of 11 before presentation. Her workup showed an LDH of 650, undetectable up to globin. Her Coombs was negative, and she had many, many schistocytes. You know, one of them is shown here in her peripheral smear. So serum creatinine continued to increase, and creatinine by day five reached 8.5, quite aggressive presentation. So C3 was normal, C4 was low, ANA was <coughs> uh, uh, positive, and she had a double-stranded DNA, which was negative, but SSA and SSB, serologies for lupus, some of them were positive. So her kidney biopsy was performed on day five, and it demonstrated you know, diffuse microtrombi into the kidney pure on a mesangioproliferative lesion of lupus, but she also has severe endothelial swelling suggestive of thrombotic microangiopathy, and it was read as active and chronic thrombotic microangiopathy. So let's look at her hospital course. She got pulse steroid on day five in the setting of lupus. She was initiated on plasma uh, exchange, therapeutic plasma exchange on hospital day five. She also was initiated on hemodialysis, quite a busy day five, and she was really sick here in the hospital. So her maha and thrombocytopenia persisted despite all the above treatments. Her Adam TS13 and antiphospholipid on hospital day 10, this is how long it took in an academic center in Boston for Adam TS13 to come back, 10 days. So it was normal you know, normal activity, and the uh, she got toxin. We got it in 24 hour, and antiphospholipid uh, were negative also. So she was continued on plasma exchange, and by day 15, while on plasma exchange, she developed severe angioedema requiring tracheostomy. So we had a grand round here. I was not involved in this case myself, but I was on this grand round, and like the case was described, and everybody, it was a combined grand round between hematology and nephrology, and we all agreed that, you know, probably an alternative therapy should be used, and here we're talking, maybe you should try eclusimab, like the patient is resistant to all the, what you tried so far, and this was decided on day 15, so on day 15 to 25, there was further discussions about the treatment, like should we use it, not use it, and you know, day 30, Eclusimab was introduced on day 31st. The patient becomes severely ill, and she was made comfort measures on day 36, she died. So this is in 2015. So I can tell you that it's not always, you know, it's, it's not only difficult to pull the trigger on the diagnosis, sometimes it's also difficult to pull the trigger on the treatment, because a lot of physicians don't have the experience to use Eclusimab, they're afraid to use it. And, you know, this is where Craig and I, we said, you know, I, this could not continue to happen. And we kind of came with this idea, maybe we should build a TMA team in our hospital. And our concern was just to make sure that we have a team who can be focused on treating patients with thrombotic microangiopathy in our hospital. And why is that? Because we thought it's a very rare disease, very high morbidity and mortality. It's a really difficult to accurately diagnose. And this, there's always a delay in the diagnosis in a lot of centers. And this results in delay of initiation of appropriate therapy. And as Andrew was saying, like there is a certain like window when you intervene, you can salvage organs. And if you delay intervention, you lose the organs and you have to deal with dialysis, transplantation, all, all what comes after that. And we also felt like the field is rapidly e evolving and like you need somebody who's like really into it and kind of like up to date on what's going on. So <clears throat> back to the case, just to show you in our, in our case, there, the delay, there was a delay in diagnosis of 15 days. There was a delay in Adam TS13 testing of 10 days. There was a delay in the treatment initiation of 30 days. And this is what happens. There's five intensivists who were involved in the case, four renal attendings, five hematologists, two rheumatologists and one blood banker, 17 physicians on one case, 
and the diagnosis took 15 days to make and the treatment took 30 days to, to give. So, and what happens is like, you know, on Friday, Andrew say, you know what, I'm gonna sign out to Jean. Jean, uh, I have this patient, I want you to give eclusimab on Saturday. Jean comes and is like, oh my God, on Saturday, Sunday, we're not gonna give eclusimab. So we wait for Craig to come on Monday and Craig will give the eclusimab on Monday. Craig wants to think about it and a delay, and a delay, and a delay. And this is typically what happened in this case. And I believe it happens in a lot of medical centers and a lot of hospitals all over the United States, all over the world. So based on, the, on that, you know myself, Craig, who's sitting here, uh, Dr. Quillen is our plasmapheresis uh, director, uh, Mark Sloan, a hematologist. We have a pharmacist with us. We have a pediatric hematologist with us. And then we added a rheumatologist and we added an OBGYN physician as we moved forward. We don't have an intensivist. We don't have a primary care or hospitalist in our service. But this is something we're thinking about adding, adding those, uh, uh, those uh, providers. So we put goals for our team. Number one goal was clinical and improve patient outcome, improve patient outcome, improve patient outcome. Number two was educational, and number three, research. So how did we do it? So we built protocols and algorithmic approach to potential TMA cases. Our job is not to take patients from their primary care, uh, pr primary providers. You know, you continue to see your patient, but we come on board, help you with the diagnosis, do the testing, you know, do the peripheral smear, spin the urine, uh, uh, do the biopsies if we need to, organize the testing that is focused on TMA while you care for your own patient and we communicate with you on a day by day, on a second by second, and try to help the the consultant in the hospital to deal with those complicated cases while they're carrying another 20 or 25 patients that they have to care for. And uh, uh, you know, we created the EMR interceptions, like anyone who's ordering ADAMTS 13, they get a trigger now called TMA team. We thought about putting low platelets as a trigger and we imagined we're gonna get like a thousand consult per week and it would be impossible to handle and like look through all those charts. So we felt at least ADAMTS 13 would be good. And, you know, we are available all day, every day, every year, every month, every week. We're 24 seven available. And we carry beepers and one of this team is gonna be on call. You know, we can decide on a weekly basis, on every two weeks, on every month, it doesn't matter. And, you know, we, uh, we uh, as I said, we do not replace the primary consulting. We're here just to help. We're available by phone, by emails. And when we get consulted, between us, the team, we kind of distribute the work. Like, for example, I go into, you know, take history from the patient, review the chart, while Craig is spinning the urine, while uh, Mark Sloan, our hematologist, is doing the peripheral smear, and then we convene and meet. I bring my data, they bring their data, and we brainstorm as a group and make a diagnosis and make a decision, and then run it by the primary, like this is what we decided, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna plasma freeze this guy, we're gonna give eclusimab, we're gonna treat hypertension, we think this is DIC, so every time there is you know, a case, we kind of, this is how we approach it as a group and communicate with patient and communicate with the providers. We, this is our algorithm. I'm not gonna waste your time over it, but we try to get, go step by step, ruling out DIC, ruling out Chiga toxin, ruling out TTP, and then move forward to the secondary forms as much as possible. Then if we can't have any explanation, we consider it atypical HUS until proven otherwise, and we treat accordingly and see what happens to the patient. And uh, you know, I think following this algorithm, we've been quite successful. As uh, you know, we build also a EMR order set for all the tests that are required for uh, for the for the uh, thrombotic microangiopathies in general. And you know, we also created a uh, linked ourselves to the CTSI of uh, Boston University Medical Center. We created a website for ourselves so people can you know look at our algorithm, look at our d d differential diagnosis. So people in the hospital or outside the hospital can do that and like really uh, uh, help uh, guide themselves in, the, in making a diagnosis of TMA. So our second step, we felt all this is great, but if the hospital doesn't know about us, the provider don't know about us, the resident don't know about us, the fellows don't know about us, it's useless. Like we need to get known in the hospital. And this is when we went on multiple teaching sessions into the hospital. We targeted everywhere. 
uh, you know, mortality, morbidity conferences, grand rounds, nephrology rounds, hematology rounds, hospitalists, intensivists, OBGYN. We went every possible way to talk, ER, hospitalists, residency, fellows, and we keep doing it. And, you know, we created flyers for ourselves in the hospital, like attached in the working rooms of residents to, you know, like, what's TMA, when to think of TMA, and how to call us. And this helped us a lot to capture a lot of those patients, and everybody knows about us now in the hospital, and everybody thinks TMA, like we educated people about TMA, we educated them about the team presence, and this helped a lot, honestly, to catch those patients and direct them toward us. You know, we worked on our Adam TS-13 and we dropped the turnaround time now from 10 days to 24, 48 hours. This is very, very reasonable at time. She got oxygen is still done in our hospital and like within 24 hours we get it. You know, genetic testing when we need it, we collaborate with a lot of labs, you know, uh, with Dr. Richard Smith in Iowa, Maytion in, uh, in uh, Oakland, California, or sometimes we send to Denver in case we need to uh, test for any genetic mutations. But all our work is based on the clinical presentation, data available in our hospital. We do not rely on genetic testing to decide on clinical management. This can take you know, now it takes days, but it could take weeks in, other, in certain labs to come back and help you and guide you in the treatment and patients cannot wait. This is a list of patients that we came across since the, uh, uh, this is a, a, a snapshot of few, few cases, not all cases. And as you can see, our diagnosis time and intervention is occurring instead of 31 days in 24 hours. This has probably took a bit longer, three to five days. We were fresh and new here. We probably didn't know what we were doing at the beginning, but you can see the improvements. You know, two days, three days, three days, three days, 24 hours, 24 hours, and we're intervening and making, you know, every effort to treat the patients appropriately. And, you know, those are other cases. I want to focus a little bit on this case here. This is uh, a recurrent uh, atypical HUS after kidney transplant. This is a 20 years old uh, uh, young man who uh, 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 emigrated from Spain with like 11 family members, a big family, and came to, uh, to Boston, and he was diagnosed with a renal failure in Spain since age two. It wasn't clear to us what's causing it. There was no kidney biopsy, and then he ended up requiring transplant, and we were able to catch him uh, uh, before going on dialysis and do preemptive kidney transplant. I was always worried about the possibility of this could be an atypical HUS uh, on this kid, but you know he was not on dialysis. We tested him for LDH, aptoglobin, peripheral smear. There was nothing to suggest active hemolyticuremic syndrome on him. And because of insurance issues, we could not get uh, genetic testing. You know, they, they, they are on, under what we call free care in our hospital, which means, you know, their care is just provided in our hospital, and we weren't able to do genetic testing. So we gave him a kidney, and his sister was the donor. And this transplant, I still remember, was done on Wednesday. And on uh, uh, Friday, I was rounding with our surgeon, and I hear him saying that his platelet count is very low, so we're not going to give him thymoglobulin today. So I look at the CBC. White cell count are fine. You know, thymoglobulin usually makes you leukopenic before it makes you thrombocytopenic. So uh, I was like very suspicious and I said, you know, let's order LDH and aptoglobin. So we ordered an LDH, it came at like 780 and his aptoglobin was undetectable. So uh, we, I was on the fly, I activated the team and uh, uh, you know, our hematologists were able to identify many, many schistocytes, as you can see. There was many of them, it was loaded and then we, uh, gave him on that day at the first dose of eculizumab. And, uh, you know, his creatinine, be although it was a kidney donor, live kidney donor, was, you know, sluggish kidney function and creatinine stuck at 4.7. His platelets dropped to 35. And after the first dose of eculizumab, he jumped to 48. And by Monday, he was like 68,000 uh, platelet count. I did a kidney biopsy on him. And you can see microtrombi. Uh, uh, into, into the uh, microcirculation of, of the kidney, suggestive of thrombotic microangiopathy fresh after transplant. He did not receive a prograph at that time. He was only on, on thymoglobulin. And uh, thankfully, otherwise we would have called it like a, 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 a prograph-induced TMA or whatever after transplant, but he was not on the prograph yet. So, and his creatinine dropped from 4.7. I saw him a week ago, he's 1.7 still on eculizumab, and he's doing fantastic. We did genetic testing on him, just to tell you, and it was 
there was no detectable uh, uh, mutation. And as you know, 50% of those patients don't have a detectable mutation. So if now, you know, should we continue? I'm continuing with treatment. He's tolerating it well, and he's doing fantastic. So this is a problem, you know, when you have to use you know, a caduzumab into the hospital, you know, it's always a problem for the hospital. It's a very expensive drug. And I think now with our presence and us being as a team of experts saying that this drug has to be used, the hospital is very supportive and we try to use it as soon as possible and get those patients out of the hospital and continue the therapy outside the hospital, which is a win-win for the patient and for the hospital so they don't have to like ruin their economies. So our efficiencies are key, you know, to making this team concept supported by our institution. And, you know, we proved shortening lengths of stay and, uh, you know, we shortening time to diagnosis and intervention. You know, we improved a lot of testing in the hospital to help us do that. And, you know, we reduced tremendously the utilization of plasma exchange when it is not necessary. And, you know, uh, uh, and less utilization of ineffective resources, I think, saves money to the hospital. And this, we hope, we have to prove that yet, that it helps improving patient outcomes. And to take it uh, the last step in our team, we also created a research arm and was in collaboration with what we call in our hospital the Affinity Research Collaborative. And this is an arc on thrombosis. This is a, a research collaborative where experts in, uh, in different fields, could be a mathematician, statistician, a biologist, a, uh, a molecular uh, you know, a biologist, a geneticist, a physiologist, whatever. They all come together with one interest in one disease and try to work together to understand this disease. And it turns out that there was, there was one uh, 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 ARC created for studying thrombosis in general, so we found ourselves a good link and like a translational part of this ARC. And through this ARC mechanism, we were able to get funding for three years, 15 to 2018, to build a registry, a biorepository, and we are also developing now an assay for complement activity. And you know, we are working with a lot of scientists in this arc, some people interested in studying the platelet activation, some people interested in studying the endothelium, and you know, some people are interested in studying the complement, the thrombosis mechanism in TMA, so every scientist is studying something uh, different. And we collaborate a lot with Marina Norris for any genetic, uh, genetic uh, uh, testing and then a research perspective. So <coughs> uh, uh, yes, we face, we face problems. And this is lack of awareness. And we realize, like in July, people don't consult us anymore. And it turns out that there's new fellows, new interns, and they haven't heard of us. So you have to keep re-educating. So this is a big effort you have to do in your institution. If you are to create a, a TMA team, keep the education, keep the education, and increase the awareness for everyone. And people forget. You have to remind them of the disease and of yourself. And uh, you know, paying for the drugs is an issue sometimes, but you know, so far we're doing well. Yes, we've been slow to fill our registry. I think we have, we've seen a lot of patients, but people are sometimes sick and they, wanna, they don't wanna give you blood for your registry. They don't wanna talk to you sometimes, you know, about research and things. So what, uh, 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 what we think is, you know, if other institutions create TMA teams and create their own registries and their own biorepositories, I think this is how we could collaborate as TMA teams collaborative and, uh, you know, help to improve and advance, you know, uh, the knowledge about the disease, awareness about the disease, and even research in the field of uh, TMA in general or atypical HUS in particular. And our concept has been recently published in the American Journal of Kidney Disease. And with that, I would thank you, thank the organizers, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you, John, very much. Um, again, uh, we have uh, some time for question and answer. If you could uh, move to the microphone or pass the microphone around. Um, John, just uh, seeing the outline here, um, the amount of work that you all have done, um, do you sleep? <laughs> I, I, and and the, the reason I ask that is because when, when it's communicated to other hospitals to generate this, uh, there is resources that are being diverted. Yeah. Sleep time is being diverted. 
Um, how much extra energy do you think this is taking now as compared to when it was started in 2015? Now it's much easier, honestly. I think we are very well organized now and, uh, uh, you know, we, every one of us knows his own responsibilities. It was a bit chaotic at the beginning, uh, you know, because I think the driving force was me and Craig at the beginning, so most of the work falls on us. People didn't believe in the concept, although they joined us at the beginning, but they weren't believing. Like, what are, what are we doing? How many patients are we going to see? Like, everybody was questioning us, but I think we were able to flip that and, you know, uh, kind of see, uh, you know, you know now we, we look at ourselves as like uh, complement experts. So we deal with C3GN, we deal with PNH, we deal with like uh, uh, this disease, the thrombotic microangiopathies in general. So we're kind of like trying to engulf all the complement mediated disorders as much as possible. And I think now people are interested, like uh, we've recently been nominated in the hospital for the Clinical Innovation Award. So I I think people now are very much involved and know that we exist and this, the education part is heavy. Like you have to, you know, go rotate in the hospital everywhere and educate people about yourself. This I found the hardest thing to keep, maintain, sustain and keep this awareness of our existence and of the disease, you know, at high level. And uh, things uh, you mentioned, I think you mentioned or somebody else, uh, hematology are essential in this team. It's, they are essential because any aberration in platelets, the first one to contact is like a, re a hematology fellow and we target the hematology fellows, they automatically call us for any low platelets. So we get a lot of calls that are useless like a ITP or HIT or like heparin induced thrombotic uh, thrombo uh, thrombocytopenias, but a lot of the time this is where our cases are coming, they're coming from hematology. Another part of this also is to have someone inside of the hospital that is experienced with the hospital system. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll just be frank here, inside of uh, the academic centers, um, there's a high rate of turnover. They, yeah. they get a grant and they get a better offer somewhere else. And, yeah. and so to be able to get the, the higher level support from a chief, from um, someone inside of a uh, role of consistency, I, I, I think is important as well, especially with the residents when they're coming exactly. through so much, to be able to talk to and the director of the residency. I'm glad you time. said that because I think a key to our team success in our institution was the support from chief of nephrology and a chief of hematology who believed in this concept and were really behind us. And and they are on the team with us as like uh, 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 to guide us, to help us. You know, our chief is a compliment expert and you know him very well. So we run to him in like tough cases and we try to seek his uh, opinion. And he's always available and has been very supportive from the get-go. And I think this is important. And this is when the uh, hospital believes in you. Like if they see that you have the support of your chief, your chair, and another chief and his chair, and the hospital is not going to resist. You know, we don't get credits for that. It's not like I have an FTE assigned to TMA. It's not like I get uh, RVUs. I'm sorry to speak like that. This is something we work on it because we like it and because we want to make a difference, because we think those patients deserve the best care possible.